Thank you very much. Thank you for introducing me. Hi, my uh, name is Carolyn Warner. I'll be giving a aforementioned talk. Um, this is uh, ongoing work. Uh, so no finished paper yet, but there is a draft of a paper here. If you want to check that out with all the info and more from this talk. Um, and it's, it's a symmetric construction. So this is symmetric um, code-based cryptography, not asymmetric, just to be clear about that. So um, what is the setting? The setting is basically media streaming and radio transmission, but really any data is transmitted via noisy channels. Physical channels are simply noisy. And usually the way we deal with this is by reducing noise using forward error correction and rejecting messages that still have errors using message authentication. Now, the question is, can we do any better than that? And I think the answer is yes, we can. Oh, that doesn't work properly. I think the answer is yes, we can. Uh, the first goal is security against fuzzing, uh, which is just better reliable reliability in shared media transmissions. And I'm going to formalize that later. And the second goal is providing security under partial message recovery. And message uh, partial message recovery basically just means even if there are many bit flops in the ciphertext and the original ciphertext cannot be recovered. Um, the, the scheme still decrypts and it will decrypt to some related plain text. But I mean, of course, the assumption is that this can be done securely. And this is basically the second goal here. There's some, there's been some previous work uh, on approximate message authentication codes. And these generally returned a hard decision, uh, which is a constant. And so, um, uh, one thing I wanted to do is return a soft decision. So you can, you, you get a accurate picture of how high the error level is and maybe can adjust the redundancy using that uh, that uh, secure estimate. And then there also has been some work on encryption and the noise, um, which is basically the same thing I'm trying to do here. But these uh, schemes and papers generally didn't have a real in-depth treatment on the achievable security properties and um, security properties, defining them well is, um, is, is a goal uh, of this work. So um, just um, from a bird's eye view, what is decryption despite error supposed to do? So on in, in this box here, we basically have a visualization of, uh, of, of the cipher space in just normal symmetric encryption. And you can see these white spots, these are invalid messages, and these blue spots, they are valid messages. And these blue spots really are normally just points. They're just a single message, a single blue point in a sea of white. And what um, decryption despite errors does is basically it produces this halo of related messages around each original ciphertext. Original ciphertext here in the center and around there is this halo. And these... Um, these, these related messages should decrypt to related messages of the original plain text in, uh, in, in the message space. That is the goal. And, um, can we do it securely? I think we can. And just, just, just from a functionality point of view, um, the, 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 the kind of goal I've come up with here is the idea is to let the attacker raise the level of random noise in the plain text, but not let them induce any specific noise patterns. And again, we have the visualization here. We have this this ring. Uh, it's it's shown as a ring, but really it's more like like a halo because there's some 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 um, smooth drop off outside, and all points on this ring basically roughly decrypt to points on this other ring in message space. And uh, so all, all points on these on on these rings, are of course, the same hemming distance from the original ciphertext. And then even if we have two adjacent messages in cipherspace. Um, they can land in two completely points on that ring in message space. And that is basically just this random noise, but not specific noise pattern security property. Besides two, two, uh, these two properties, uh, another property is uniform importance, and that's basically security against fuzzing. And that just says flipping any bit in the ciphertext versus flipping any other bit in the ciphertext should on average produce the same number of errors in the plain text. And then, of course, an adversary should be unable to produce new errors just um, at some. Take some message, encrypt it already, and then change that, but not produce a completely new encryption. So um, on the left-hand side here, we have basically just the definition of the scheme. And oh, that doesn't work again. The encryption function is basically just as we used to, and the decryption function is slightly changed. 
um, it takes a related ciphertext with errors and outputs a related plain text with errors as well as an error estimate. And this error estimate, which is um, elaborated on down here, basically is uh, an estimate of the number of bit flips in the plain text. Um, and the scheme also takes a redundancy parameter. Uh, this is not useful. The scheme also takes a redundancy parameter because, of course, this includes forward error correction. So security and redundancy are separate properties of the of the cipher. Um, so first thing is security against fuzzing, and that basically just extends CCA2 security. And um, this 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 can be. Um, this is equivalent to CCA2 security. If we impose a maximum of a weight zero here, this, this should basically be equivalent to normal authenticated encryption. And so basically security against fuzzing uh, starts with authenticated encryption and adds this extra property. And this extra property is security against fuzzing. And the attack model is here. Basically the goal of a fuzzer is denial of service. They don't really want to learn anything about the plain text or change it. They just want to to denial of service. And um, so if the adversary is able to erase the entire message, of course, um, then, then security is impossible or preventing denial of service is impossible. So um, the uh, limited quantity on the side of the adversary is the number of bit flips they can induce this year. Um, and so this is supposed to model like shared mediums where an adversary doesn't forward message, they just sit on on the transmission channel and produce noise, basically. And then here we have the um, the the more formal security notion. It's not a fully formal one yet. It's more formal. And basically, this is forward error correction on the CCA attack, and it, it says larger redundancy means more errors can be corrected. And this is the game, and th this is more more um, more a fragment of the game or part of the game because it's long and it doesn't fit on the slide and it's too much information. But the key points are basically the adversary gets to choose two messages and two redundancy parameters. Um, and then the game encrypts those um, at the chosen redundancy and the adversary chooses two syndromes to induce in, 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 in the ciphertexts. And these syndromes have to be of the same Hemming weight. Um, so two syndromes, same Hemming weight, and the adversary wins if the message with higher redundancy yields decryption with more errors. Normally you would expect more redundancy means more errors can be corrected. And basically the adversary's goal is to break that expectation. Uh, and something that this should imply that for every error rate, there exists some redundancy parameter that will recover the full message. And I should have added there that this is um, with high probability. So let me just point out here a little caveat that these these definitions are right now unstable and they're they're kind of in flux and they're fairly hard to define because of this soft decision nature. There's there's not really any really any cutoff point in normal authenticated encryption. You can just say, okay, my cutoff point is the message has to arrive properly or it arrives not at all. And here there's always this need to have this 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 soft area in between, which is very hard to model. And um yeah. So partial message recovery is the second notion, of course, and this is the, the more key one for, for this work, basically. And the, the, the first realization is, is that partial message recovery is incompatible with all non-malleability games. Um, all standard definitions of non-malleability games, let's say that, because of course an adversary can just always induce um, induce some number of, uh, they, they, they can always induce some bit flips and then just use the Hamming distance relation essentially from the original plain text to win non malleability game. So achieving these is impossible. Um, but one thing that can be achieved is indistinguishability under CCA1. And so um, I'm going to start with this one. And then the question is, can we actually do any better than that? And the idea here is partial message recovery. Um, uh, no, proportional loss is as I've called it, and this is indistinguishability under CCA A2 up to proportional loss and an equivalent notion in non-malleability. And there, these two games, so in instead of just reading them out loud, I'm just going to point out some key facts. And of course, there's, again, not all information here. Um, and basically, 
these security definitions should land us somewhere in between CCA1 and CCA2 security. Stronger than just CCA1, but not as strong as for CCA2. So first thing to point out is that the adversary gets to choose the message or the message space in the case of non malleability as they do in, 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 in the standard games. Um, and then they get to choose syndromes again of the same hemming weight. And this is always the same pattern syndromes of the same hemming weight. Um, and uh, same thing here, they choose in, in non malleability because that's how non malleability works. They output a relation um, and uh, a vector of syndromes of the same weight. And then basically in indistinguishability, these two syndromes, the, the decryption of these two syndromes X or the ciphertext. Uh, produced by the game should be indistinguishability and in non-malleability it's this more complex thing which I invite you to just uh, read the original paper where these original notions were defined. This is just relations among security notions and this is just the basic um, security games. This is modeled upon or the basic security definitions. Besides uh, these, these non-malleability and indistinguishability properties um, uh, there's also an adaption of uh, unforgeability, adapted from SAFCMA, basically, um, because this provides not a message authentication code, but a error estimate. Uh, and this error estimate, so, so there's no notion of this error estimate independent from decryption. So the attack relevant here is CCA and CCA2 attack, uh, and not CMA attack. And the game basically just works uh, as usual, the encryption oracle locks all encryptions, um, and then the adversary submits some derived ciphertext or a syndrome, and we can compute the derived ciphertext. And then um, we look up, the game looks up the closest ciphertext plaintext pair, that is by using the ciphertext and this lock. And then uh, it takes the most likely original message and uses that to arrive at the exact error level, the most likely exact error level, um, and uh, subtracts the error estimate from that. And then that should be inside a window because yes, of course, absolute, this is not vector size, but absolute. Uh, and then that should be inside the window imposed by this delta W parameter. Um, and that is basically the second approach that instead of uh, instead of just using some some hard point, uh, I use this um, this this window of OK outputs, and as that in increases in size, um, the probability of an adversary winning the game should decrease. That is basically the way to deal with this um, this continuous domain. So that one thing. There's one thing. Too much mouse movement. There's one thing I should point out, and then that is that um, not having full CCA2 security ha has real implications, and that is this short distance brute force attack. And basically, the adversary always has the ability, and this is more in more detail in those two points, the adversary has um, has always the ability to introduce a specific number of bit flips in the in these ciphertext, and these will be randomized. So if, um, if an adversary wants to say induce a single bit flip on average, um, th they can just do that. Um, uh, these bit flips are chosen at random. So an adversary can just can just um, do multiple times do, do multiple tries of submitting just just random ciphertext to induce a specific number of errors in the plain text. And if they have some specific bit they want to flip, they can basically achieve that with a probability of one over the number over over the size of the plain text. It's a bit different because this is really a distribution, but that's it in a nutshell. S Apologies. So um, the complexity of that attack is linear. Um, in the special case that that the number of bit flips an adversary wants to induce is just one. Uh, in the more general case that there are multiple bit flips, the um, um, I, I call it here search base, but it's really actually the complexity is given by this relation with two facultative terms, um, uh, which approach either this, which is um, the size of the plain text raised to the number of bit flips the adversary wants to produce, or 
size of the message facultative if the adversary for some reason wants to flip all bits. So this is a non-polynomial. So um, uh, the, 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 so, so this is a brute force attack and this grows very quickly, but for short uh, error vectors, this is a problem. And then the adversary can, so, so we can do some things to deal with that and use some mitigations, but there's no real way to achieve non-polynomial complexity here. So no real security, just mitigations. And of course that attack requires a decryption oracle and still requires on average a couple, uh, a couple hundred attempts. So, um, so yeah, this, there, there is still some security here. Um, so how, um, how, so, so, so now moving on to the, um, to the construction that is conjectured to have these properties. And basically I'm going to start with encryption in the random Oracle model, um, because I don't really want to define a from scratch PRF or PRP. So I start with that. Um, and uh, I choose the unauthenticated version because of course I need the malleability, which brings me to uh, in CPA security and lots of malleability. And this is obviously not the security uh, I want, but it's a good place to start. And this is a very well established um, notion. So it can be instantiated with things like deck functions. So I could instantiate it with uh, Chacha 20 or something for speed. So very well established. Um, and then to achieve CCA1 security, I use this construction. Let's say conjectured. Um, uh, and basically this is a forward error correction step sandwiched in two shuffle operations sandwiched in XORs with the keystream. And these shuffle operations are fully randomized with the keystream. Or no, actually this is the way to go. Fully randomized with the keystream and the security is supposed to come from the fact that these shuffles are fully randomized and an adversary doesn't know which bits to flip. And of course that breaks down in a CCA2 attack, but this is why this is CCA1 secure. And let me just point out that this scheme has some similarity with McAleese, because um, if we if we instantiate this with a copper code and then use um, a um, a permutation, a permutation matrix view on this on this shuffle, this is kind of similar. So it might be interesting to see if there's some connections or if there's some way to use similar structures, um, but I haven't done that. And so um, to achieve full CCA2 security, the idea is to just use multiple rounds of this shuffle and forward error correction sandwich structure. Um, and um, yeah, so uh, in the forward error correction view, this is basically just um, concatenated forward error correction with fully with fully randomized and uh, with a fully randomized interleaver. And in the symmetric crypto view, this kind of looks like a substitution permutation network shuffle as a P-box and forward error correction to induce diffusion. And this is basically what makes probing the structure hard because of this diffusion and permutation. And of course the attacker actually needs to probe a large amount of information because everything is randomized in here. And so let's look at how this performs in action. This is basically just a simulate. It's not real. It's just it's just how it's supposed to work. It's a visualization of 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 how it should behave on a dif differential attack. And basically, uh, the idea is to um, so so for for um, low weight syndromes, the um, this the structure will correct all errors because it's error correction. So low weight syndromes, no errors make it through, and no information gained. And under CCA. Oh, one slide too many. Uh, if there are more bit flips, um, they may make it through. And then here we have this residual error. I call it residual. Um, and then as more bit flips are added, I hope this is visible. My computer is behaving strangely. As more errors are added, um, the, the behavior is kind of random because um, uh, I'm, I'm not going to go back to show you the difference, but basically in round two, before we had uh, three bit flip, uh, three bit flips as or four bit flips as input and two as output, and now we have more bit flips as input and more bit flips as output. But due to the shuffling, one bit flip actually moved location; it switched one thing to the right. And due to the shuffle, um, um, the the location is randomized, and now this um, this syndrome is more sparse, and the FEC is assumed to be better at correcting sparse syndromes than dense syndromes. And this is where security comes from. 
And just one last thing, you, you may notice that in the structure I've just shown you, security and redundancy are linked because adding more security means adding more rounds, which means adding more, more error correction. And to deal with that, to make redundancy not excessive, basically the idea is to use puncturing and just take out some of the, some of the output of this forward error correction to reduce the redundancy. And then normally what I do is just, uh, just fill those in with constant values. What I'm going to do instead is use a randomization oracle. And um, this is basically structured like a message authentication code, and but, but a message authentication code extensible output function. So just another key stream for decoding. And I'm going to fill in the punctured values with um, those random bits. And this basically means that an adversary now needs to probe their syndrome they're inducing down here, plus all these completely random values they have no information about and they cannot probe because it changes every time they submit a new syndrome because it's it's a message authentication code. And so this adds a lot of randomization. Um, um, next steps, iron out the kings like the difficult um, uh, security notions, instantiate the scheme and create a proof of security. Those are the basic next steps. Um, and right, if you're interested in the theme, here's, here's just a summary of the key points if you're interested. And if you're, if you, if you want to check out more about it, you can basically go to this Git repository. There's a draft, which is very much a draft, but it contains all the information from here, um, the slides, and I'll, um, upload the video I just made. And so you can rewatch that if you want to check it out again. Thank you very much for listening.